Now, the hip, and from working with Dr. Liftoff and looking at knee patients and so forth, he's taught me that the knee is sort of the canary in the cave of the lower extremity. The hip joint is a really sturdy ball and socket joint. It may actually be the cause of the extremity symptoms, but it's not often the first thing to be painful. And the ankle's a good mortise joint. It also could be a culprit. Often foot strike is the culprit for a lot of the extremity symptoms translating to the back. But the knee tends, to, they present with knee problems. But if we'll treat while we're doing, particularly if you do a John Liftoff technique, treat the knee, but then go to the hip and treat those key little neural bundles. You will reset the hip rotator cuff, and then you can also reset the foot strike. There seems to be a fuse box for every joint. We talked about the quadrilateral space for the shoulder. Sometimes if you're just looking at a patient, just put 10 cc's of D5 right there, and it is amazing how it will reset everything. So in the knee, it's right between the soleus heads back here, and in the hip joint's a little more complex. That's why I want to talk about it. The foot's pretty simple. The tarsal sinus is a great spot to inject to reset the ankle. Again, no financial disclosures. <clears throat> Again, the key is diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. Uh, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery just put out a white paper on causes of hip pain and okay, you're not gonna be surprised. Steroid injections, physical therapy, NSAIDs, everything we tell our patients not to do except the physical therapy part. This is getting our patients ready for surgery. And they'll do steroids maybe two or three times and then the patient's told, well, you failed medical management, you're ready for surgery. Now the beauty of the, we talked about static stabilizers in the shoulder. Osseous stabilizer is not so great, but in the hip, awesome. A nice big socket, nice big ball joint, and a lot of muscles uh, from adductors to abductors to hip, hip rotators. But the, so the osseous static structure is awesome. The internal ligament structure, um, here's the transverse ligament here. You see the hyaline cartilage. It, it even has a rim to make it even more deep. Now it turns out often it doesn't need that. Some of the problems with hip Issue, issues are hip impingement. In other words, the cup is too big for the head. It's called uh, uh, pincer type femoris tabular impingement. Now, uh, ligament, ligament, ligament. So when it comes from the iliac to the, to the femur, it's the iliofemoral ligament. Here they are. The more you move and rotate the hip, the tighter they get to center that ball of that femur. So the ligaments are key. And now we're going to look at the osseous anatomy, the iliac wing, the pubic symphysis. Here's the hip joint, and obviously the SI joint. Uh, the arrangement here is a ring, so it's very difficult. If you take, took a pretzel and tried to break one ring, you'd break the second part. So often the pelvis may be injured on this side. We need to look at the whole thing uh, because it's almost always a secondary stress point. Here the ligaments are. One of the key ligaments here that uh, our incoming president uh, taught me to, to inject with his uh, Cajun Prolo is iliolumbar ligament. It's an enormous pain generator. It's kind of grouped along with the sacroiliac ligament, and we kind of inject it anyway, but if you'll, and he'll show you how to do palpation. Andrew did that very nicely yesterday in a professional course. About two finger breadths off midline, and just below the L4-5 disc is the transverse process of L5 and you'll get to inject the uh, lumbosacral and the iliolumbar ligaments. Those little guys right there is, are big time pain generators, so don't forget them. <clears throat> Obviously the anterior bands, a p com composite of the SI joint. Now posteriorly, we'll look at this in a minute, but the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments are key to giving you piriformis problems. Remember we talked in the shoulder, the rotator cuff muscles, the one yelling, the one that's creating pain, and the one we're doing all the surgery on, but what's the problem? Glenohumeral ligament. So when you have a piriformis muscle problem, it's the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligament insufficiency. So treat those ligaments and tighten them up and the muscle will go, thank you very much. And then here's the, uh, the uh, uh, ligament structure down here. Now, <clears throat> these little blue spots are going to be the little bursa, and they're just blisters and potential spaces. And when you see a bursitis, the trochanteric bursa is going to be over here over the greater tuberosity. You don't have a, it's very rare to have a primary bursitis. That's a friction syndrome between mus muscles or, and or tendons that are just confused. 
So when you see inflammation of the trochanteric bursa, don't just inject that with steroids. Treat the ligamentous instability. Uh, the obturator ex uh, externus is on the surface of the obturator foramen. And then here we have the uh, adductor musculature here coming off the ilioinguinal ligament. And here's the adductor brevis. And here's the magnus down here and the gracilis. But all this musculature here uh, is a potential source for entrapment of those nerves. Remember when Dr. Liftoff was talking about constrictive lesions, these nerves have got to work their way through from their origins of the sciatic to the superficial femoral surfaces. Anywhere in there they get, they get it impinged upon, it'll make them sick. Now here's the iliopsoas. The psoas actually has two heads and it converges with the iliacus to the uh, lesser tuberosity. That is a very powerful flexor and internal rotator but it also has the biggest bursa in the human body. And when you got an iliopsoas bursitis, you got trouble. Um, here's the gluteus medius. It attaches on the apical facet of the greater trochanter. And here's the quadratus lumborum. So you've got a lot of muscular stabilizers. But just as Dr. Fullerton showed a minute ago, these muscles are important ma for maintaining posture. To, to allow me to stand here, the muscles are not holding me up. They're very greedy energy-wise. What they're doing is resetting my fascia. So I'm nan nanosecond moving around all the time that you can't see. The musculature is just resetting the fascia. When the fascia is torn, particularly in this lumbar surgery, the thoracodorsal fascia, it doesn't work well. And now the muscles have got to overwork, and that's when you start to get in these pain syndromes. It's a ligament issue. Now we've got the uh, uh, iliopsoas here. Now the uh, gluteus uh, medius is here, and we're starting to see the quadriceps, straight head, and so forth. So you can see, and by the way, here's the uh, uh, piriformis muscle here. He comes right off of here. So when the muscle's mad, the sciatic nerve's got to go through him, and if he's constricted, he can act like an L5 or an L4 or 5 disc, but the constriction of the nerves in the muscle, what's the fix? Fix the ligament instability, and it lets the muscle relax. And then, don't forget, you can have ischemia and the iliac artery and all of its branches, and also there's an iliac vein. The uh, mnemonic from lateral to medial for the structures here, and you don't want to nail any of those things, by the way, when you're doing a hip uh, joint injection, is navel, nerve, from lateral to medial, nerve, artery, vein, lymph channel. And once you feel the pulse of the, of the femoral artery, you can get in the hip joint easily just by going lateral to that. Now, again, here's the ring of the pelvis, Here's the obturator foramina. When you look at them on plain film, if they're different shapes, then the patient's rotated. But if they're laying flat and that's their normal, they have a pelvis rotation. And when you do that, your hip joint will change heights. It'll make you feel, look like you have a leg length discrepancy. Your right iliac turns posteriorly. It'll lift the right foot off the ground. It looks like your right leg short. And you buy a lot of shoes with half-inch lifts. Why do I know that? Okay. Uh, the first time that I had a side joint problems, I was told my legs were a different length, and about five or six years later, I met a guy that says, your legs are the same length, your right iliac bone's rotated, and he put me on some wooden blocks, and in a month, my heels hit the ground at the same time, and I went, anybody want to buy some shoes with a half-inch lift? So the osseous anatomy is key. The ligamentous anatomy, and this is the long anterior longitudinal ligament that goes all the way to the base of the skull. It's the anterior longitudinal ligament down here, but when it hits the skull, the cranial cervical junction, for some reason, it's called the tectorial membrane, same structure. And now you can see the complexity of the ligaments. So people have SI joint problems for different reasons. Ladies have it when they have babies, and they have a collagenase to digest all the collagen to allow the pelvis to open and deliver the baby, but afterwards it doesn't set right, and they may have a leg link discrepancy or SI joint problems from that. Guys typically, when we used to wear those big wallets, would sit in the car and turn, rotate our pelvis. Um, so SI joint problems, you've got to stabilize those ligaments. Now, hip and groin pain can come from a uh, number of sources. The articular part is the ones that were the most interested. Oh, I've got arthritis, I've got bone on bone and all that. It's a ligamentous issue and the tendons and muscles around it are the pain generators, and yes, there may be erosions, but once you get the hip moving normally, all that cartilage will come back, back to life, just like we talked about in the shoulder. 
So uh, hip ligament uh, labral tears. Uh, we've got this nice blue cartilage and this transverse ligament to deepen the cup. And now this little green object right here is going to be our um, fiber cartilage. It deepens the, the cup. Now, there is a, a, a teres ligament tear. and This is a very rare finding, but you can have a hip effusion. And if you don't do MR, you won't see it. And it's not visible on ultrasound. And then on plain film, you won't see it. But you'll see this edema right here where the ligament of teres attaches right in here. It's very important for the vascular supply of the femoral head, and thank goodness it's very rare. Generally, it's a subluxation injury in these rugby players. Now, here's the hip capsule, and here's a very subtle iliofemoral ligament tear. Look how subtle that is. If you're not looking at that, that's a gorilla. Okay, these are red as normal all the time, me, uh, me included if I'm not paying attention. See that little tear right there? And look at the little fluid between the ligament. Now we're starting to look at acetabular tears. And I can tell you, it's like in the shoulder. I think I talked to one of the gentlemen here. Uh, the labral tears, the, the classification, I think there's from 1 to 20 now. And the radiologist that talks about this says, well, you think you haven't seen a 16B, but you have. And then he shows a 17C, and then, but I got news for him. We treat them all the same way, uh, regardless of what grade. We're going to treat them with regenerative therapy, with either prolo, say, injection, and with uh, physical rehab. It uh, doesn't matter the classification. Here's what the anatomy looks like. The labrum is dark when it's healthy. A fibrocartilage is labrum. It's like a uh, bone. Bone has very little free hydrogen. So normal bone's black, a normal uh, 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 labrum is black. Look at the tendon insertion. So healthy stuff is dark. And when it starts to get gray or you start to see fluid where it doesn't belong, then you got a problem. And here's where you go through all the stage, early changes in signal, stage 1A. I'm not going to bore you with it other than you're going to read this on your reports and you're going to go, what the heck? March on. It's not about that. And all by, by the way, these are all normal. So it's a hard job to call these grades and whatnot. Let's just treat the patient. How about all right, now here's a true ligament tear, and there's a paracapsular cyst. Just like in any joint, particularly the shoulder, when you see a paracapsular cyst or a parameniscal cyst, you've got a tear in the meniscus, or in this case, the cartilage. And it's just letting fluid sneak through that little riff. Is that of great consequence? Other than it's a harbinger of, of abnormal motion, yes. And you can aspirate them if there's some consequence. If you fix what's making that joint fluid happen, it'll quit happening too. And here again is a little paralabral cyst here. These are pretty easy to see. What they're telling you is not so much the fluid collection, it's just a light bulb saying, look at me. And there's a, a ligament tear. Generally the problem is, and we'll talk in a moment, you can see the femoral head is already too big for the capsule. And this so-called pincer type, um, it's mixed femoral, it's a cam type where the femoral head's too big and the capsule's small. So every time you bring your hip up and internally rotate it, you shear off that labrum we see this all the time in football players. And it's kind of structure versus function. You need to do some MR imaging, not all the time, but in this case, I think it's important. If you're born with inverted, uh, antiversion of the uh, acetabula or your femoral neck has got too high an angle, antiversion there, then you can't play in a three-point stance. We tell those kids, look, it, there's nothing wrong with you. That's the way your hips are. Stand up and play linebacker or do something, but you can't be playing like that. So that gives the patient solace that it hurts, but it's okay. It's just the way I was made. Some of us can't do everything. It's the old, if it hurts when you do that, don't do that. Now, these are the attachment sites here. And again, I'm trying to make this to get... Okay. Let me go past. It. And these slides are available. I swear, you sit and look at them, they'll talk to you. They'll, they'll give it... This talk will give itself... Um, Let's talk about femoral acetabular impingement. You hear about all these angles. Here's a normal relationship of the femoral head to the acetabulum. This little guy is too big, and the femoral head neck junction is too fat. There's no groove in here that'll allow you to do this without nailing the acetabulum. And here's what it looks like on an X-ray. The edge of the femoral he head is out here. Here's the bony acetabulum. You know that the fibrocartilaginous labrum goes here, but it's still not deep enough. And like a cam function, when you, inter when you uh, flex your leg and internally rotate, you, you, you ping on that, that uh, uh, labrum. It's not 
you don't need surgery to fix it. You need to quit doing that. And again, here's kind of what they look like. This little thing's not shallow enough, or that thing's too deep, or both. But so you'll see these on your reports, and it freaks people out, and, and they are actually doing surgery on some of these kids. And what they need to do is play a different position or a different sport. And this, this is the pistol grip deformity. You see how the femoral head's oval, and it's just not fitting in the socket. In this case, the femoral head fits too deeply in the socket, so you don't have the room to bring that up. And sometimes that happens in older folks when the femoral head kind of sinks in from some osteoporosis or osteomalacia. And again, here's where the femoral cups are in the wrong position. So there's nothing wrong with this kid. Uh, it's just the way he was born. It's a structure trumps function. And now we talk about osteochondral. Here's a microfracture here. Pretty easy to see that. That little cartilage sliver is kind of easy to miss, though. But it's just basically trauma to the, to the joint. And again, marrow edema, obvious as I'll get out. Um, here's a condition that was thought to be a precursor to avascular necrosis. It's just transient osteoporosis of the hip. What the heck is that? I don't know, but don't touch it. It'll go away for, in six to eight months. And it's pretty scary. It's fun to talk about and to present at conference. I've done it a million times. And then these stress fractures happen right here. Right along the inner curvature of the cortex is a stress line. And, and you can't really see it on the x-ray. And, and it's really obvious. Again, what do you do? Quit doing that. Well, I only run 30 miles a day. I mean, come on, really? What are you running after? Ice cream? Maybe go do that. Here are these little subtle uh, fractures, the inferior pubic ramus. There's a lot of real subtle things, uh, particularly with the tug lesions where the muscles and tendons attach, and they hurt like all get out, and, but they're not fractured in the sense that you don't need to walk on them, but you do need to look at your gait and things like that. And here's all these little tug lesions of the kids. When you're young, where the ligaments and tendons attach, uh, pull off fairly easily because the, the growth centers aren't fused. So they get apophyseal tears. Well, like Osh could slatter in a knee. So here's all those spots here. And if you look at these little kids and have the hip pain and pelvic pain because they only play one sport 36, uh, I mean 24 7. Uh, we were younger, we played everything. But nowadays, the competition is where they play one sport all day, every day. And so they're putting a lot of stress on the same spots. So they're not abnormal if you can ever get them to let their coach not make them run the hurdles and the 400 and the whatever and let them swim, they'll get better. Here is a, um, a hamstring insertion tear. Now this generally happens in younger folks. Uh, generally when we tear a hamstring in an older person, you better think about anterior cruciate ligament the uh, hamstrings hold the tibia from anterior translation. Not all the time, they wanna move the joint, they don't like holding it. The anterior cruciate ligament keeps a an intact ACL, keeps the tibia from going forward. But when your ACL's torn, the hamstrings gotta hold on all the time and they don't like that. And that's why the hamstring's the most commonly torn muscle. I inject the hamstring, but the thing I do is treat the ligament. It's the ACL insufficiency that causes the muscle tear. In kids, they pull the, the apophysis, and now we're seeing in some football players and rugby players are also pulling the apophysis. And then here's the uh, rectus femoris insertion, and here's the anterior superior, the, the tensor fascia lata. So on MR, these are real obvious, but again, the treatment is very simple. Regenerative injection therapy, do whatever works, prolotherapy, cellular PRP of any type. But the rehab is the key, physical rehab. You know, we're real close to the 3.30. Why don't we take a break? Is that okay, Mikey? And then we'll get back on track. And, and again, these slides are yours, and I'm here this, this whole weekend. Thank you. 3.31.